Hi guys, carrying on from the previous video, I'm going through some questions for the SAA C02 exam. And these are part of about 100 or so questions that have recently been released in our practice test course for the CO2 version of the exam. So if you're studying for that one, this will help give you an idea of what the questions might look like. So let's have a look at this next question. So a retail company with many stores and warehouses is implementing IoT sensors to gather monitoring data from devices in each location. The data will be sent to AWS in real time and a solutions architect must provide a solution for ensuring events are received in order for each device and ensure the data is safe for future processing. Which solution is most efficient? So I'm gonna try and pick out the things that really make a lot of sense to me. Firstly, we've got real time data, so real time is pushing me towards, I can see these answers coming up here and I've got Kinesis data streams and SQS and I'm straight away thinking Kinesis because it's real time data and that's what Kinesis is for. And then it says that the events need to be received in order for each device and ensure the data is safe for future processing. Okay, so in terms of order, we're talking about maintaining the order of the records that go into the stream or into whatever service. So if it's a message queue or a data stream. So let's have a look at SQS. I want to eliminate SQS because I'm starting to think straight away that real time data pushes me away from SQS, but I want to be sure. So let's have a look. So a standard queue, that's not going to maintain that order. So it's not going to maintain the order of the messages that go into the queue. It's best effort ordering. A FIFO queue will do that, so it will maintain the order. It's first in, first out. So the order that messages go in is the order they come out again. But I don't like SQS for this use case because this is real-time data coming from IoT sensors. So it doesn't seem like the right use case. Let's just read the second part of this. It says, trigger an AWS Lambda function for the SQS queue to save data to EFS. Well, that's possible. Um, you can certainly trigger a Lambda function and it could write the data from the queue to EFS. But I still don't like this answer because I think the Kinesis Data Streams answers are going to be the best use case for real-time data. So now let's have a look at these two. Now, the first one says, use Amazon Kinesis Data Streams for real-time events with a partition key for each device. And the second one is similar. It just changes it to a shard for each device. Well, partition keys are used so that you can organize the data by shard. So you can send data with a particular partition key to a particular shard. And then within the shard, it will then maintain the order of the records that hit that stream. So that sounds like a good option. I think it's better than saying shard for each device. We're saying a partition key for each device. And that would be what you would order your records by. You could then say that for each device you have a partition key, that puts it into a particular stream. Now the second part of this is similar for both answers. We've got Kinesis Data Firehose, so you can definitely take records from a data stream and have that as the source for Kinesis Data Firehose. And then Firehose will then load it to a destination, and that destination can be one of a few services, but EBS isn't one of them. So S3 is one of them. So S3 is definitely a legitimate data firehose destination. So even if you are thinking, well, maybe a shard rather than a partition, that answer is eliminated because we know that we can't have EBS as a destination for firehose. So I'm going with this answer. And sure enough, that's correct. And then we've got a bit of a diagram here where we have producers sending data into a stream and you've got all the different shards. And so in this case, you could then order the data that goes into that stream into a specific shard using a partition key. And then your consumers can then move data to destinations. Well, in this case, you might have a data firehose stream, which then loads to an S3 destination. So it's a bit different to this diagram. So let's move on now to the next question. An Amazon VPC contains several EC2 instances and the instances need to make API calls to DynamoDB. A solutions architect needs to ensure that the API calls do not traverse the internet. Right, okay, so 
Obviously DynamoDB is a public service, so that means that you connect to it over the internet. So even if you're in a VPC, the normal way would be that you, you hit an internet gateway or a NAT gateway, which then goes to an internet gateway. But either way, you're going to the internet and then connecting to the public service via the internet. Well, in this case, we wanna avoid that. So straight away, I'm thinking there's gotta be an endpoint. So you know about endpoints that you can have are a way that you can connect to public services privately. So using your private IP addresses, never traversing the internet. So which one of these options sounds like the correct answer there? So the key facts you need to know to be able to answer this question is first, you need to work out whether we're talking about an interface endpoint or a gateway endpoint. So those are two different types of endpoints. Now I know that DynamoDB and Amazon S3 use gateway endpoints. So the next thing you need to know is with a gateway endpoint, how do you configure your VPC so that your instances can connect via that gateway endpoint? Now there's two different ways. One is applicable to the interface endpoint and one is applicable to the gateway endpoint. So one is with an elastic network interface where you have an ENI, which is an endpoint in the subnets within your VPC that you can then connect to that service. Now I know that that's not applicable to gateway endpoints and we definitely have a gateway endpoint for DynamoDB. The other way is a route table. So you basically update your route table with a route that goes to that gateway endpoint and those two work together. So for DynamoDB, these two are the correct answers. Let's have a look at the other ones just to make sure that we can eliminate them. So create a new DynamoDB table that uses the endpoint. Well, you don't need to create a new DynamoDB table here. That's not necessary. We've eliminated the ENI answer because that's applicable to interface endpoints. And create a VPC peering connection between the VPC and DynamoDB. Well, VPC peering connections are between different VPCs, not a VPC and a public service. That's what our endpoint is for. So I'm pretty sure that these two are the correct answers. So let's click on check. Sure enough, those are the answers. And a bit of a diagram here with DynamoDB and a gateway endpoint, and then some instances within a VPC. So they can be in different subnets. They're connecting via the gateway endpoint. Obviously there's a route table entry that's directing them there, and then they can then connect to DynamoDB. And you can see the right route table entry here. That's a bit small, so I'll just zoom in for you. So we've got a destination and then it would have a target. So that's that one, let's move on. So an organization has a large amount of data on Windows SMB file shares in their on-premises data center, and the organization would like to move the data into S3. They wanna automate the migration of data over their direct connect link. Okay, so this is a data migration question. And straight away, I'm looking at the answers here. There's a couple that are quite easy to eliminate. So first, database migration service. Well, that's about migrating databases. This is data on an SMB file share. So that's a Windows file share. So database migration service is not the right one. CloudFormation is a tool for automating and orchestrating the implementation, the deployment of infrastructure. So CloudFormation is not the right answer. Now Snowball is a physical device which gets transported to your data center or to your office and then you load, you load the data onto it and send the device in. So that's for when you've got huge amounts of data that you don't have the internet bandwidth all the time to, to wait for that to transfer. So that's gonna be out as well. So this is another one where it's pretty easy to eliminate those three answers. So the last option is data sync and data sync is a service that you can use to migrate data. It will do it online and it will do it from SMB file shares and NFS file shares. So I believe that's the right answer. Let's click on check. And sure enough, that's the right answer. So let's go and do one more. So a website runs on EC2 instances in an auto scaling group behind an ALB and it serves as an origin for a CloudFront distribution. Okay, so we've got a CloudFront distribution and then the origin for that is an ALB and behind that you've got some auto-scaling EC2 instances. AWS WAF, so the web application firewall, 
is being used to protect against SQL injection attacks. A review of security logs revealed an external malicious IP that needs to be blocked from accessing the website. What should a solutions architect do to protect the application? Okay, so we're using WAF to protect against malicious attacks and we've got an IP address that needs to be blocked. So how are we gonna go about doing that? There's obviously a few places where security is applied and we need to work out the right method and the right place to, take, uh, to put that security control into action. So let's go through these in order. Firstly, we've got modify the network ACL on the CloudFront distribution to add a deny rule for malicious IP addresses. Okay, you can add deny rules to network ACLs, but there's no network ACL applied to a CloudFront distribution. They're applied to subnets within a VPC. So that doesn't work. The next one is modify the configuration of AWS WAF to add an IP match condition to block the malicious IP address. Now, I like that one because you know we've got WAF in the front. This is something that's coming from the internet. So you kind of want to block that traffic as soon as you possibly can. And this is exactly what WAF is able to do. And you can definitely match by IP address and block IP addresses. So that makes a lot of sense. The next one is modify the network ACL for the EC2 instances in the target groups behind the ALB to deny the, to deny the malicious IP address. So modifying the network ACL for the EC2 instances. So that's the network ACL that's applied to the subnets the EC2 instances are in. Well, there's a couple of issues with that. Firstly, the source IP address is gonna come from the ALB. It's not gonna come from the external endpoint because at this point it's gone through an ALB. And secondly, you're kind of leaving it till almost the last minute there just before the traffic reaches the EC2 instances. So even if you could do it at that layer, why would you not do it back at the AWS WAF layer? The next one is modify security groups for the EC2 instances in the target groups behind the ALB to deny malicious IP addresses. Well, as you hopefully know, you can't put deny rules into a security group. You're basically putting in allow rules. You're basically saying this, this port, this protocol combination from this source address is what I want to allow and everything else just gets blocked by default. So you can't put a deny rule in for an IP address into a security group. So I'm pretty sure then that the correct answer is to use WAF with an IP match condition. Let's click on check. And that is the correct answer. So I hope you enjoyed that and I'll be doing some more questions in another video soon.